So here you're going to be listening to part one of Kilimanjaro Diaries. Now, I've had to split the podcast into two parts because it was just so jam-packed with solid gold content. So um, in this first part, we're going to be hearing about the preparation leading up to Kilimanjaro, our experiences and approach to the medical briefing and our reflections on the first few days on Kilimanjaro. And welcome to the World Extreme Medicine podcast. I'm your host for today, Dr. Fionn Davis, expedition medic and emergency medicine doctor. I am very excited about this podcast we've got together for you today, uh, named Kilimanjaro Diaries. So um, to give you a little bit of context, last year I was fortunate enough to be invited to support a charity trek up Kilimanjaro as the doctor. This was my first time climbing Kili and I was pretty excited and pretty nervous. I had been to altitude on a trip before at Mont Blanc, but never as high as this. And Kelly is most expedition medics first trip to altitude. And it's safe to say it's not to be underestimated um, for several factors that we're going to discuss in this podcast. I also learn an awful lot from this experience. Uh, and I think that is sort of rounded me a little bit more as an expedition medic moving forward. In this podcast, myself and my fellow medic on the trip, listen to some of my voice recordings that I made whilst on the mountain and reflect on our experiences on Kilimanjaro. Welcome to Kilimanjaro Diaries. So I would love to know any listeners thoughts on this. So if you've been up Kili or if you're planning to go up Kili, please send me a message on social media or contact the podcast via the WEM website um, or comment on the uh, podcast on Instagram. Um, or keep an eye out for the blog post and you can pop a comment on there as well. I'd love to know your opinions on some of the stuff that we've discussed on here. If you've maybe had similar experiences or anything that you're maybe worried about, if you're going up Kelly yourself as a medic, uh, please get in touch. So this podcast came about because I was recently asked to give advice to a friend of mine who was about to climb Kelly as a medic. I found myself scrolling back through some of the notes and voice memos that I'd made for myself on my phone uh, to dredge up some sound advice and some tips. As I did so, it really transported me back to breathlessly recording some of my reflections in my bright orange medical tent, watching the sunset on the mountain out of my tent door and listening to the hustle and bustle of camp around me. And I felt ready to share this memory. And I thought, who better to share it with than my fellow medic on the trip? Introducing Dr. Francis Screech, expedition doctor extraordinaire and my good friend. Francis, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, everybody. Expedition Doctor Extraordinaire. That is quite the intro. Um, hello. So what an absolute pleasure it is to have been invited to have a natter on the brilliant WEM podcast with the amazing Fion. Thank you very much. So I am Francis. I work in the BRI in Bristol as an ED and Expedition Clinical Fellow. Uh, in case anyone's interested, it's a one year job that I'm sadly approaching the end of, but I definitely recommend it to anybody with a burning desire to get out there and work as an expedition doc alongside their NHS work. Um, I'm starting anaesthetics training in August, though, so I'm joining the hundreds of doctors balancing training with the amazing world of expedition medicine. Um, so I'm hoping through this podcast, I found that there isn't loads of information available for the aspiring Killy doctor. So I think this series and this podcast will give a realistic insight into the trip for us uh, from the perspective of two doctors who I think at the same time had our first experience of altitude medicine. So, Fionn, first of all, do you want to explain why you're recording, recording voice memos in your tent on your own like a bit of a weirdo? Yeah, well, I definitely felt like a weirdo doing it, but it's turned out to be quite a useful thing to do. Um, so firstly, I'm a really lazy journaler and I know a lot of expedition medics like to keep a journal on expedition as a sort of um, mental health kind of outlet. Um, but carrying pen and paper seems like extra weight and a bit of a hassle to me. So um, I started recording these little voice memos at the end of the day, kind of reflecting on the day and it was my way of kind of coping with some stresses and kind of offloading rather than writing it down in a journal. Um, it can be really arduous on an expedition and sometimes quite lonely as the medic. And you may not have anyone else to talk to about some of the sort of medical stresses. 
So it's important to have some coping mechanisms and a sort of mental toolbox that you can use that are going to be practical on expedition. Um, so I found it really helpful. And then it's really nice to be able to look back on the recordings and kind of remember what I was feeling and thinking at the time when I was sort of cozied up in my sleeping bag reflecting on the day. How about you? Have you got any other coping mechanisms you like to go with? <laughs> That's so wholesome. I love it. Um, so I definitely, I am a reflector. I definitely lie in bed and I love that bit of expedition. You take yourself through the day and sort of think, yeah, through everything that's happened, good and bad. Um, but I don't actually record my musings anywhere. Maybe I should. I feel like that's quite a productive and useful thing to do. But um, in terms of relaxation, until I started this kind of expedition journey, I always considered myself to be super sociable. Um, but I don't know, that's sort of waned, I think. Since working on the longer ones, I've definitely realised that I, um, I perform best if I've had at least some time on my own. Um, so during Killy, uh, we were usually camped at different spots, weren't we? But uh, I used to grab a cup of tea when we got to camp, when everyone used to sit down. And I'd sit with them for a bit, but then I'd go and yeah, take my tea back to my tent. And it was often under the guise of running an evening clinic, which... Obviously, I did do as well, but if nobody appeared, uh, then I'd sit there, read a book for an hour and just have a bit of time away from the group before dinner. Um, I used to think, oh, it always surprises me or surprised me. You just have to be on all the time as the expedition doc, don't you? And I find that, um, you know, supremely fun, but it is also one of the most ex exhausting bits of expedition medicine for me, because uh, I think a huge role as the doc is needing to be uh, full of energy and really motivating and I can do that and I enjoy it but I do definitely need a bit of time on my own to recharge to actually be able to do that um, and do it kind of justice and I think it works if I have that time I've, a few people have said to me why doesn't the altitude affect you or like why are you so full of energy and you might be dying inside but you're actually full of bounce and life and I think yeah just a bit of time on my own and that conscious effort and I know that about myself now, so I take myself off for some me time. You definitely gave one reason. Any other reasons? Uh, Are you so blogging, second, general? So second reason for recording voice memos in my own, or on my own in my tent. Um, it sounds really weird when you say it out loud, but I promise it's not as weird as it sounds. You're going to find out anyway, because you're going to hear the memos. Um, I found it really difficult to keep up with the medical documentation on expedition, uh, which sounds silly, but you are probably asked about 20 million different things a day, about little minor things, or um, how much should I be drinking, or I've got a bit of a headache, is that okay? Or like, can you just have a look at my foot, or, you know, my rucksack's a bit funny, can you just, and you just get like, all oh, my back's hurting, my neck's hurting, you. you get all these little things that people come to you just as you're walking throughout the day, and if you had to stop and document that every single time that you had one of those little queries um you'd never get up the mountain so it's just not practical to document sometimes as well when it's sort of like minus 20 degrees i think that's what it was on our summit night on Killy. Yeah. uh and you can barely feel well. your hands let alone write something down um and you can barely breathe as well so it's just really <laughs> not top of your priority list at that point um so yeah, one of the ways that I record my thoughts, uh, observations, feelings, medical concerns, uh, consultations is to record myself a little memo at the end of the day, whilst it's still fresh in my head. Um, and it takes like two minutes, you know, really quick and easy. Um, yeah, and gives an amazing memory of my thoughts at the time, but also something to refer back to when I'm catching up on medical documentation later on. You actually told me uh, <clears throat> about that little hack on, I think, day two of Killy when I'd been wrestling with flapping bits of uh, the uh, paper flying all around the mountain. So I stole your plan and recently got back from Island Peak. It was blooming cold and everybody decided to go wrong within about a 48 hour period. Um, and I think trying to write notes at that stage would have genuinely been the straw that broke the camel's back. So yes, thank you for that, that one. And like I do it on every story. expedition. Yeah, it sounds like there's definitely a story there. I'd love, like, like, love to hear about it, but we better stick to Killy for the moment. And Killy today. We could natter all day long, couldn't we? Love it. So let's transport ourselves back. We starting our prep for Killy um, via the Machame route. Um, and just for a bit of context, there are seven routes up Kili. And the Machame route is the most popular 
uh, route up the mountain and it starts from the southern side of Killy. It's one of the shortest, um, at five nights and six days, most groups do it, uh, but it's not the shortest. There are some crazy ultra runners who do it in sort of, I think, three nights, four days, something like that. Ugh. Um, yeah, crazy. Um, this route starts at Machame Gate um, at about 1800 meters and ascends to Uhuru Peak, which you may not know if you've not been to Kili, because I thought Kili was going to be called Kilimanjaro Peak, um, but it's not. It's called Uhuru Peak is actually the top of the mountain at 5895 meters, so just shy of 6000 meters um, over the course of about five days or so. So, um, one of our first jobs when we got to Moshi was, well, let's actually just talk about arriving into Moshi to start with. (laughs) What were your first impressions when you got there? Oh my God. What a place. So I love it. Um, I, I love and sort of crave chaos when I've been in the UK for a bit long and I feel like I'm stagnating. I, um, I just dream of a bit of you know, exciting chaos. And I think uh, the Tuk Tuk ride to my hotel on that first night is something I'll remember for a long, long time. Um, I do think, you know, that exhilaration, you hanging on to your Tuk Tuk, doing the death weave through the traffic. So you never admit that to your group, do you? But that's definitely one of the highlights of all of these trips. And I definitely think, apart from my beloved bike, um, Tuk Tuks are definitely the way to travel. And I also remember uh, I think I got there maybe a day before you, or we hadn't met up because we didn't know each other then. And I found this amazing cafe, uh, all sort of leafy, very beautiful, called the Freedom Cafe. Amazing food, but more importantly, uh, it. So I sat there all day and read all of their stuff, but they are a charity where they provide jobs um, for local people who are survivors of sex worker trafficking. Um, And they also provide sort of education and try and uh, build these women back up and re, you know, get them ready for the community again. Uh, So that was kind of one of my first introductions to Moshi. So I've still, yeah, it has a really special place in my heart. I much preferred it actually to a Russia uh, where I went after for sort of safari stuff. And I think uh, I just think, can you remember when we arrived to the hotel, I met you and we met some of those other doctors and they just looked so broken. Absolutely can you remember that? <laughs> yeah. That was my first warning. I was like, oh my God, what have I let myself in for? Uh, and the other, I kind of feel the other overriding thought is, I just felt like such a legend doing a medical kit bag check underneath a palm tree with uh, these amazing bird calls it felt very warm balmy exotic and i was like this is this is proper expedition medicine and it was very exciting uh almost as exciting as when we went to the pharmacy and we were like oh we need to go buy some more undanzatron <laughs> and some more dexamethasone i can't remember what else but we had a whole list didn't we of like stuff that we needed um and so that yeah, poor ops manager was the poor old simon who came with us was like i've never seen two people so excited to buy a load of medicines for a kit bag I think it was like, so I had bought um, medications abroad before, but I had no idea what the deal was going to be in Tanzania before we got out there. And then I was super excited when they they were just like, yeah, here you go. Have all the meds you need. Um, You know, codeine, tramadol, whatever you want, over the counter. (laughs) Um, Spent a lot of his money, didn't we? (laughs) Yeah, he wasn't excited about the bill. But we were like, these are essential medicines. We need them. (laughs) Um. I remember you were so excited, speaking of tuk-tuks, you were so excited about your first uh, uh, like medical emergency that you got to arrive to in a tuk-tuk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when I we do. got like, down the mountain <laughs> and uh, one of your group had had a bit of a drama and so we had to go and check it out. And then you, you were like, call the tuk-tuk, get the blue <laughs> lights on it, let's go. It doesn't get better, does it, than a rapid response tuk-tuk. <laughs> Is that in um, fact? I genuinely think maybe that is the solution to the ambulance crisis. Tuk tuks. Oh, yeah. moving in and out of traffic. You know. Yeah, not, easy. Not great patient transport ability, really. But... <laughs> That's true. That is true. Um, I remember my also for one of my first impressions of Moshi was near death experience in a vehicle, and I was I just got off the plane. You have to take two planes to get to Moshi. I did anyway, and then yeah. um, somebody met me at the airport, and it was in this like van where like the seat belts didn't work and like. Yeah, and, and the window didn't roll up fully or something. And then 
I'm pretty exhausted at this point. I've been traveling for like nearly 18 hours or something to get here. And the guy's like doing these really dodgy overtakes and there's sort of goats <laughs> and cows and children all over the road. And I was like, oh my God, this is, I'm not going to make it. This is where I die. Um, <laughs> before you get up the peak. Before I even get, I was like, this is probably the most dangerous part of my trip right here. No yeah, yeah. Um, and then I was so exhausted, but I was like, I can't go to sleep because I, I kept having to think I was going to have to like take the wheel or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can't fall asleep. I can't fall asleep. And by the end, I was like, Do you know what? I don't care if I live or die at this point. I'm getting some rest. And so I just got my head down on the seat and just <laughs> hoped for the best. I was either going to arrive in one piece or I wasn't. And that was that. Um, yeah, that was my first impression of Moshu. And the fruit bats in the hotel, actually, as we we're checking the medical yeah. there were these huge fruit bats hanging from the eaves of the, uh, the hotel. That was really cool as well. That was cool. And we also got a hell of a greeting. Can you remember? There was a lot of photos with, with the staff. They were just wonderful. Oh, that was because nice you were a good looking white bloke. And they were like, yes, this is my future husband. We need to go and get some pictures with him. It's true. It doesn't, it's not an effect that tends to happen in the UK, I find to me, but you know, you know, there's room for, I quite liked it. I was there for it. <laughs> okay. So hopefully we've set the scene a little bit about arriving in Moshi, some of the crazy driving, the tuk-tuks, etc. And then one of our first jobs as the medics was to deliver the medical brief. Um, and I remember we were conferring uh, over what we were going to say and we had slightly different <laughs> approaches to it. But I think it was uh, we, we both delivered kind of slightly different medical briefs, but pretty much in the same kind of vein of things. Do you remember what yeah. we sort of said? I thought it was it was really interesting, wasn't it? I think we were both I think when we were discussing it, we both felt um, a bit scared because I think it's quite hard I think it's quite a hard one that initial brief to deliver well um, and to pitch at the right level I think they're quite rightly super excited keen to get going uh, but they're also tired jet lagged nervous um, and then I think from my point of view it was really important to well and yours too to introduce all those important topics of hydration nutrition blisters hot spots and then I think we were both quite excited uh, about talking about the sexy stuff like altitude illness. Um, with a, but you kind of know if you've done any form of education and with your medical educator hat on that, you know, someone who's, you know, probably super excited and they're jet lagged and, you know, they've probably been making the most of the free booze on the flight. They're not going to retain much of that stuff. Um, and you also, I was really aware that I didn't want to terrify them too much with the haste and hape stuff, but also wanted them to understand what was going on. Um, so I found I did do, as you did, a pretty comprehensive brief, but then ended up repeating lots of it um, almost every night. Um, not, you know, all as one, but various segments as they became relevant, um, I'd repeat during our kind of evening briefing after dinner was that I think that really helped kind of normalize the weirdness that's going on in your body um, as you start going up through the altitudes. And I think by doing that, less people would come and see me because they actually I briefed everybody that you may feel, you know, these variety of symptoms as yeah. we start getting higher. And I think that was helpful. Was that something that you encountered? Yeah, sort of setting expectations on what mm. they sort of what would be normal, what would be something to worry about. Um yeah, and the repetition as well, really key there. You can definitely tell you've done some medical education, you know, the old spaced repetition is key, yeah. isn't it? So, and not to overload them when they're they're tired and like you said, um excited and uh yeah, they don't they're not gonna take in an awful lot of information at that point at the start of the trip. Um I think I maybe took just a slightly different approach, a very sensible approach. But I think I was like, right, I've gotta keep their attention, keep the keep them listening to me uh so i'm gonna keep it maybe like entertaining but terrifying sort of thing mm. <laughs> in order i to... do remember death came up in yours and it didn't come up <laughs> and it didn't come up in mine but <laughs> yeah i think fairly early on i was like people die on this mountain you need to listen to me so that that doesn't happen to you <laughs> <laughs> i've actually got a little quote from my this is what i finished my medical briefing with um, I'm not sure I would word it quite like this now, but um, I think it, it was effective anyway. So I finished with, this is a challenge. This will be the hardest thing you've ever done. And no amount of words can describe how much you will suffer. 
it's a strong start i know um <laughs> you, will, you will have a headache all of your muscles and joints will ache you will be unimaginably fatigued <laughs> and you probably won't sleep well your body will be suffering and not operating at 100 percent uh, near the summit, the oxygen level will be less than half of what's available at sea level. All of this will make you feel like shit. <laughs> and there's not much I can do about that. It's part of the challenge. Embrace the suffering. And I think I said it with a kind of grotesque smile on my face, which hopefully made them laugh, but also kind of made them take it a little bit seriously as well. And I hope kind of um, put us all in the same frame of thinking that this was going to be hard and that we needed to be mentally prepared for that. And I think even though I'm sort of giggling at how harsh that is, I think we noticed uh, the different expectations of our two groups as we went up with our different approaches, didn't we? And I think, um, yeah, possibly I needed to be a bit harsher. <laughs> Talk about the unimaginable misery a bit more. <laughs> And how I can't really do much about it. That's that's part of the Yeah, that was the key. That was the key. Whereas mine thought I had a lot of options. Um, and you've only got, you know, a small medical bag. You've not got all, you can't solve every single problem that they come to you with. So yeah, it's about no. setting those expectations. But also I was worried that I was going to make myself seem unapproachable and like a bit of a kind of mean, hardcore medic. Um, I definitely oh, they loved you. The... They loved you. I went for the hardcore briefing approach, but I think I finished it off with right at the end. Um, I want you to come and tell me your best altitude joke as we're going up the mountain. And I love all things plants and animals. So please come and tell me about them just to, you know, lighten the mood at the end there. I feel like yours got involved with some singing as well. That definitely lightens the mood. Yeah, there was some singing, definitely. They're all a bit stunned, but um, I did want them to be <laughs> properly prepared for how hard this was going to be. Um, yeah. And uh, just look, I'm in the process of writing a blog post for uh, med my medical briefing for Killy and kind of stuff that I included, because we could definitely talk for probably about an hour about all the different stuff that we wanted to go through within the medical briefing. Um, so keep an eye out for when that's published. A little bit more detail I there. I think that will be really valuable because I found like hopefully there's some people listening to this podcast who are in the, you know, in the lead up to their first Killy trip and definitely um, you scour the internet for any information you can find. So I think how to structure a, um, a medical briefing will be a supremely useful bit of information. Yeah, and actually now that I've got that written down, I find that you can just tweak bits for various different trips as well, you know, for altitude or no altitude. <clears throat> Okay, are we ready to listen to the first recording? Oh yeah, let's do it. Jump into it. So this is taken from Shira Camp. Um, this is night two on the mountain. So we've already spent one night at Machame Camp. Um, and then I've got up to Shira Camp and I started making my first recordings. So day two completed on Kilimanjaro. Currently tucked up in my sleeping bag, listening to all the noises of the other people in the tents around me chatting. Porter's having their dinner. It's been a good day. Um, we started off at Machame Camp, where we walked to yesterday. So we started off at Machame Gate. We walked up through a really nice rainforest to get to Machame Camp. And uh, had the most beautiful view of the sky. I think the best view of the sky I've possibly ever seen. The Milky Way was really clear. We got with some really nice pictures. Um, the group seemed really good. They worked together as a team really well. They're for the most part pretty low maintenance. It's proving really important to drink lots of water, at least three litres. Keep emphasising that to the group. Champagne coloured pee. Getting on really well with them all. Again, it's sometimes difficult to keep that professional boundary, especially on expedition. But I think that on the whole, I think I've probably got the balance right. Um, yeah, I think uh, we did, all did our sats at camp today. Ah, today was a really good day. A little bit more technical, a little bit more scrambling some like rock kind of rocky path with difficult footing at times which is kind of interesting and we were coming up through pine forest which is really nice with the most amazing spanish moss i've ever seen in my life um so much of it and so long so i bored everybody about moss facts obviously um 
And then we got to camp today. I started feeling a little bit breathless on exertion, like struggling to maintain conversation sometimes. A little bit of a headache after a few hours at camp, which is 3,800 meters. Um, food is really good. Hot food every uh, meal. We had pancakes and omelette this morning. Uh, checked everybody's stats at camp, which I'd say are averaging about 85, mine are 88, and heart rate about 90 at rest. Definitely feeling that, and uh, definitely feeling pretty gassy at altitude as well, but no diarrhea, so that's good. So tomorrow we are planning to go to Lava Tower, which is at 4,600 metres. It's going to take us about four hours to walk there, then three hours to walk to the next camp, which I think is called Barranco Camp. Um, today we walked 5k, but it's very steep. We had a lot of altitude gain. Machame Camp is at about, I think it's about 2,600 metres, so not too high. And the gate was about 1,000 so you can probably hear I'm pretty breathless actually just doing the voice memo, but yeah, it's not too bad. I'm not struggling with the altitude too much. Just taking my time, going poly poly, nice and slow. They say in Swahili. The other Swahili words I've learned are twenty twenty, which is like let's go. Jumbo, hi. Mambo, also hi. Power, it's cool. Missouri, it's beautiful, but you can also say Kisuri or Ungzuri, depending what you're talking about. The guides are really good, really knowledgeable, Set, setting a really good pace. It's literally so slow, it feels so slow, but it's actually perfect. Um, I have good faith that all of the group is going to be able to make it physically to the top but I think a few maybe might struggle mentally I did have a few throw up this morning just two actually but they've been okay for the rest of the day so not too concerned about those guys they're managing to keep food down a few people are losing their appetite a bit but not too bad I love how uh, snuggly and comfortable you sound. You can hear the sleeping bag rustling <laughs> yeah, around, yeah, yeah. can't you? Yeah. You are very happy that you're in your nice cozy down, aren't you? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, when you go away for a cup of tea, I go and get my sleeping bag. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, it's such a such a treat. And also one of the benefits of being the doc is that, that tent on your own, isn't it? When you go and mm. they will come and tell you about how dreadful their sleep was in the morning. And then you're like, oh, I, I slept great. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and how everyone um, snores and stops breathing halfway through the night. And you're like, oh, yeah, don't worry about that. That's the old altitude. Yeah, um, exactly. Um, I think one of the things which massively stands out is that you're... So that is night two of the trip, and you're already saying, tomorrow we're walking to 4,600 metres. Isn't that mad in terms of ascent? High, it's just it? crazy. It's really, really high. Um, I think... It's so nice hearing these kind of um, reflections on the day. I, When I was just jotting down some thoughts about um, the trip for this podcast, I think I've written for that first day that it was jungly, hot and exciting. Was that your, your thoughts? It felt, um, yeah, it I really felt exotic. Very chatty. They were very chatty. They were walking quite quickly and it, the jungle was quite cool. I think we saw some sort of unidentified rodent thing on a branch that was the only road the only wildlife we saw but it's beautiful flowers it was like this big canopy um and it was all quite easy walking so it was all quite um quite excited and, mm. and chatty at that point it's interesting i so mine by that stage were actually finding it quite hard and there was lots of alarmingly shiny looking shoes so I was doing lots of um stopping and already bearing in mind this was day one lots of taping feet already because I think it's because of the humidity and some poorly broken in shoes despite a comprehensive briefing before about wearing in their shoes um then there was quite a lot of blisters and people were finding it quite hard already and I think that <clears throat> slightly increased my anxiety but um they were grand and a, an absolute highlight you mentioned some of yours vomited 
and I realized that I'd bigged up the importance of drinking and I still do for every altitude trip, um, clearly, but I'd obviously, <laughs> I, maybe I wasn't very approachable because one of the girls hadn't drunk much during the day, um, but was obviously too scared to tell me that. So then um, she vomited in our mess tent everywhere, like there was vomit everywhere. Oh, in the mess and tent, not in, in the mess tent. tent. No, no, in the mess tent. And this was just, this was night one. I um, went outside with her and we had a bit of a chat about, about what was going on. And she was like, well, um, I was really worried because you said we needed to be trying to get sort of four litres of fluid down. And she said, I'd only drunk a litre today. So I tried to get the rest down before I went to bed because you said it was really important before we went to bed to make sure we'd had all that. And I was like, right. And she was like, so I've drunk two and a half litres uh, since we got back. And for context, that was probably over about half an hour. So I was like, have you basically just downed three litres of fluid? And she was like, yes. And uh, anyway, we, we saw that fluid propelled against all the sides of the mess tent. It was lovely. And that, that was my first introduction of a, how glamorous the world of expedition medicine is. Do you remember um, and yes, I've also popcorn? written... Was it popcorn ready? Oh, yeah. And when you get that, that seemed to be the snack of choice, didn't it? And then I remember as well, because I never usually drink sugar in my tea, but I did on Kitty. Um, and I don't know what it was. I think I just wanted a little bit of sweetness, but also the calories. And I just needed the little pick me up when I got there and I needed a cup of tea with sugar in it. Yeah. It was nice. Yeah. I, and you also mentioned um, that you were checking people's sats. And I, I remember that well. You know, I came to hunt you down probably for a bit of moral support. Uh, on night two and you were doing a bit of a clinic where you were checking everyone's sats and I'd started with all these great intentions of checking everyone's sats the whole way up but I had to stop because mine got so competitive that it became this really unhealthy uh, who had you know everyone would compare their sats and it was actually it who could have the highest or who had the lowest what was the well well the thing is it started as nothing like that because they didn't really know and then people started to get anxious and they'd take me aside and be like, I had the lowest sats in the group today. I feel fine, but I'm worried I won't get to the top of the mountain. So I then had to go and announce at breakfast. And I was like, unless anybody's unwell, we're not doing any more sats monitoring. Uh, I was like, it's not a helpful measure. Um, you know, we're going to go on clinical signs and how you feel and how you look. I was like, and I had to give them this, this sort of gentle telling off because they were, yeah, they were getting quite worried about uh, yeah. sats game, but yours, maybe yours were more sensible. <laughs> There was definitely a bit of competition going on between mine as well, but they were they were they were more kind of I don't know supportive about it. But um, I think I I can't remember if it was before or after, but I looked up what the evidence was for SATs altitude and whether mm. if it was like predictive of AMS or HAPE or HACE, mm. and it's absolutely not. Um, no, it's not. No. So it's kind of a meaningless uh, measure. But I think it was um it was the group that well the the organisation that we'd gone with had sort of mandated that we do it. But then yeah, it's not a it's not a particularly useful measure, but I mean, interestingly, mine, um, the guy who struggled the most did have the lowest sats. So, um, mm, interesting or, on the summit day. So, so, I mean, that's mm. just anecdotal though. Yeah, um, that's interesting. I, um, <laughs> I also feel like I've, I've already painted a, you know, less than perfect view of my group and they were, they were absolutely amazing. Um, and I did actually find it really humbling seeing, uh, when, they were a group of people from the same organization with a few randoms added in too. And I find it really humbling that after even day one or whatever, they'd be encouraging each other to drink. They'd be checking in on each other, even though that's, you know, we, we suggested they buddied up and helped each other out, but hearing them sort of sharing sweets for energy, uh, even sharing painkillers and things, it's all quite kind of, I don't know, it was a nice side of humanity to witness, I thought. Yeah, yeah, it is nice, isn't it? And yeah, I think I say in, in there, don't I, that I, I had a good group and they're all sort of bonding and looking after each other. Um, so mine was sort of uh, kind of a little bit younger than yours, I mm. think, on the whole. Uh, I think the oldest participant I had was maybe just 35 or something like that. Um, yeah. Um, and they were, they didn't all know each other, but they had had quite a few meetups prior to climbing Killy. Mm. Um yeah and they they were a good group but then I, like i said i struggled because they were sort of mostly the same age as me and so it's kind <clears> of quite hard to um yeah. sometimes keep the professional boundary in terms of like i'm the doctor uh you know you need to sort of um respect that but also 
I'm also doing this with you and I'm climbing yeah. the mountain with you and I'm your teammate sort of thing. Um, yeah. It's quite hard to sort of of strike that balance sometimes, isn't it? It really is. And another really important reflection on your voice note there is the food. I've also written pancakes, fresh fruit. Is that not mad on the side of a mountain? It oh, blew me crazy. away. Absolutely crazy. Couldn't believe it. I was like, right, this is great. I'm getting involved in this. Yeah, there was and often, you have to like your carbs, don't you? And luckily, that is not an issue. I loved it. <laughs> yeah, and I so I think I had two people who'd come to me and said, oh, you know, we, we've been a bit sick this morning on mm. um, after the first night. And I was sort of like, okay, well, did you have your breakfast? Yeah. Did you keep it down? Yeah. Okay, like, let's, let's keep mm. an eye on this and see how it goes. Um, and then I think the other thing from that first camp I remember was the night sky. Oh my god, wasn't it? Like, truly stunning, wasn't it? Go on, describe it. What did we see? Well, we saw the Milky Way. We yeah. There was a sudden a sudden kind of exodus from the mess tent as everyone went and got there. Uh, I'm ashamed to say I've got my mum's old Android, but people with good iPhones were taking some insane astrophotography, weren't they? Yeah, you could do a little long exposure on your yeah. iPhone, which meant that you really got the, the stars and the Milky Way kind of showing up really amazingly. Yeah. I used to have to go and uh, get them all to, you know, uh, WhatsApp me their exciting things so that I could pretend it was my own before I put it <laughs> on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, rather, rather than my really dull attempts at it. Um, I also remember having one of those moments at Shearer Camp where it was, we got there. And it was quite windy, wasn't it? But then I just remember you see the sunset and uh, you have Mera Peak in the background. Can you remember that? And I just remember sitting on a rock uh, watching the sunset with, you know, obviously a Serengeti. And I was like, this is about as exotic as it gets. This is oh, incredible. It was beautiful. Yeah, the sunset was amazing. You had this big, like, because isn't Shearer Cave Camp is kind of on a bit of a plateau, isn't it? And, yeah. And you, you kind of have a quite a steep climb to get up there and then it kind of plateaus out, but you're above the cloud level. I exactly. remember you had the, all this like layer of cloud laid out behind you with this one lonely mountain poking up through it. And that's one of the yeah. other cool things about Killy is that it's the it's the highest, uh, what do they call it? Highest okay. volcano. Um, like stands alone. Oh, stand alone. Like, yeah, yeah, of course. It doesn't have, it's not part of a range. It's just mm. a volcano in the middle of nowhere with no mountains around it. It's kind of, it kind of means you don't get that much scenery, but actually that night was, was really cool. And we had that mm. one other mountain that we saw. Yeah, yeah. Sunset. Um, pretty special, hey. Yeah, and I mentioned in I mentioned in there, I had somebody break a tooth at the gate, and I was like, yeah. I hope this is yeah, that's a, that's a disaster. <laughs> the rest of my trip, yeah, she she had a filling and um, it just broke straight down the filling. Um, oh no, we don't have a dental thing. kit. Did I remember that didn't, medical kit didn't have a dental thing? No, it did not have a dental kit. No, big mistake. Um, yeah. I don't think I was going to do a lot with it anyway. I sort of said just right, keep it clean, you know, brush your teeth really well, which is another thing that people don't do on expedition because they don't like to go outside when it's cold or they don't like to like walk unnecessarily to go and find a spot to brush your teeth or um, I don't know. But you, you're caning the snacks and the sugary things and the yeah. electrolytes and all this and all this yeah. is bad for your teeth. So it's super important to actually maintain good dental hygiene. Yeah, of um, course. Yeah, so I think I just advised her to keep it as clean as she could. And then she wasn't in actually a lot of pain with it. So I wasn't kind of super concerned at that point. Um, and yeah, she, she carried on fine. Mm. Ouch. Um, I think, and I'm, I mentioned I bored everyone with moss facts uh, as oh, we were coming up. So we've already mentioned, so the first day you do kind of jungle rainforest type habitat. Uh, and then the second day is sort of moorland uh, with lots of moss hanging off the trees and kind of shrubby shrubby trees aren't they and then at the end of that second day mm -hmm. we had a little bit of a scrambly bit at the end which was a little bit more fun a little bit more technical um mm. and then that carries on up the mountain so it's, this is a fun fact to tell your groups actually i remember the guides telling us that you've got these five different habitats all with our yeah. killy um so i love that yeah. journey through the different habitats it's, you really i find i really missed the kind of variety when you start getting to the um the scree scrub that you're on for a few days i really missed that you know you you're just like show me a tree i know <laughs> gets really dull after a while yeah. But yeah and i'd run out of i didn't have any more rock facts i had loads of moss facts but i didn't have any <laughs> rock facts so uh, the, group, the group were probably quite relieved by that but um 
Yeah, and then I had this conundrum about the, you know, if you've got somebody who's a little bit slower than everybody else, do you sort of try and stay at the back and do you sort of, you know, kind of try and support them? But then the majority of the people are up ahead. So, you know, where do you sort of base yourself? But I think I've subsequently now started walking more at the back uh, for most of the first few days to get an idea of who is struggling, who needs more help and why are they struggling? Are they struggling mentally or are they struggling physically? Um, yeah. I think there is a difference in the approach to it. I um, ended up in the same place. Yeah. I think um, at least, you know, you're going to come across everybody, don't you? Otherwise you're, if you're at the front, then you can have some stragglers who by the end of, you know, half a day's walking are a long, long way from the group. So yes, I, and I think I'd recommend staying at the back as well. Yeah, for the most part. And then um, you can hear how breathless I am in that <laughs> recording as well, can't you? Yeah, absolutely. And I think a thing I've learned from a friend recently who actually did get hape on a Killy trip is he was repeatedly, because of different needs from different people in the group, he was running, well, walking fast between the front bit of the group and the back bit of the group for quite a lot of the trip. And obviously we know that sort of exertion at that um altitude can be a trigger for hape so i think it's quite important to as the medic not even though you might want to be sort of running around all over the place making sure you're pacing yourself i think that's something that um, i try to do now yeah and actually if somebody gets unwell at the front then they can kind of step off the path and wait mm. for you to get to them if you're at the back exactly. rather than yeah. you sort of running up the mountain to them which obviously you can hear how breathless i am <laughs> yeah. it's not going to happen i was not going to be running anywhere now nah, um, you'd have it you got complete faith <laughs> I, I remember there was a at shira camp there was a toilet that was up a hill <laughs> i was like i i couldn't leave it until i was desperate to go to the toilet because there was no way that i was sprinting up this hill to get to the toilet so i was like <laughs> right i'm gonna go to the toilet this could be a while you know i'll just be five minutes as i get up this hill <laughs> mm. Right, so um, should we go on to the next one? So I've mentioned that... I think we should. We're at Shira Camp. Oh, the other thing I wanted to ask you about Shira Camp is you actually saw the cave. Oh, the cave! I'd forgotten about the cave. That was amazing. And our amazing guides. No, they took us over there. That was a bit of a, a lacklustre response because everyone was tired. But a few of us went to the cave with the guides and they said, um, well, they explained that that's where the... Um, the local people would have sort of sheltered and um, had a fire and where they'd have sort of told stories on the early trips up Kilimanjaro. Um, and it was, yeah, it was amazing. It was a, a proper cave. And again, there was an incredible sunset outside. So I just remember it felt like one of those pretty special, quite exotic moments. And I think it's it's important to say that Kili... Um has variable standards amongst the porters you were saying you know they would have used to stay in the cave and they quite literally probably would have used to sleep in the cave as they supported mm. people up the mountain yeah definitely um but there's the i can't remember the name of the group now we'll have to have to find it out and put it in the notes for the podcast but um most of the companies that operate on Kelly now are signed up to sort of make sure that they're providing a reasonable standard of accommodation food and that there's a weight limit on how much each of the porters can carry, uh, which I, I can't remember off the top of my head. It's something like 20 or 30 kilos, something like that. Yeah, um, I thought, yeah, I thought it was actually 15, but oh, maybe it's less I can't remember. That. Yeah. Uh, uh, but they were, yeah, it was managed, it was managed. Well after. And it had good pay. And it was strict, wasn't it? When you went in, it was measured. Yes. Which was yeah, really yeah. good. Where, where so, um, and it was... I just had a quick search and it's the the name we'd forgotten is uh, the Kilimanjaro Porters Assistance Project, KPAP, apparently. KPAP, that's who you've got to check that your company is signed up to when you want to make sure that they're looking after their porters. Um, and I think we'll touch on it a little yeah, bit later really about where the medics looking after the porters can be a little bit contentious with companies as well. Um, right, but okay, let's move on to the second recording, which is when recorded at Barranco so this is day three on the mountain and we had gone up to Lava Tower uh, which is the 4600 point and then we'd come back down into Barranco camp after that. So today we walked from um, Shira camp to Barranco camp about 10 kilometers 
800 meters of ascent up to Lava Tower where we had lunch and then 700 meters of descent. So we're currently at about 3,900 meters and Lava Tower was at 4,600 meters. Um, I think we had our proper first taste of altitude when we went up to Lava Tower. Lots of people feeling it. Uh, lots of people with headaches, losses of appetite, and um, one girl who was getting dizzy, vision a tiny bit blurry, coordination not great, but told her to double up her Dymox and to eat as fast as she could into descent and walked with her most of the way down and she got chattier and chattier. So let's just take it a day at a time. And the guy had another really bad night's sleep. And tonight is our last chance to get a good night's sleep before summiting. Um, everyone else is doing okay. A few little niggles here and there. Olga has a diarrhea this morning. Everyone's still in pretty good spirits, I'd say. It was quite a long day today for us, which sounds silly because it was only 10k, but just underestimate it at altitude, I think. Um, I had a slight headache at Lava Tower. Uh, took some paracetamol and ibuprofen and got better as I descended and drank lots of water. Still taking the Diamox. Seems to be working. Um, don't seem to be peeing too much, which is pretty good. The toilets on Killy are something else. They're actually like tiled floor, which is insane that people have actually carried that up and built it. But they're a glorified hole in the ground, sometimes with piss and shit around the hole. Like people have missed it. Um, another beautiful starry night tonight. Can't quite see the Milky Way because the moon's getting a bit brighter. But still some really cool tent pictures at night. And we had pizza tonight for dinner. Vegetable pizza, unbelievable. With some pasta and some vegetable sauce and the most delicious pumpkin soup I've ever had in my life. We are eating so, so well. And maybe you can hear in the background we have a couple of Germans in the group who are all doing pretty well, pretty strong and uh, in good spirits, which is nice to hear. It's not going to stop me from sleeping. I'm absolutely knackered. Yep. It sounds, uh, already sounds a bit less bouncy and comfortable in your tent, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. It's a short and <laughs> starting to, one, that one. Yeah, starting to feel the, feel the strain. Um, I love, you brought me back to the Diamox chat. Do we talk about Diamox a lot? Wow, it's definitely one of the favourite topics, isn't it? I think the tingles in my group probably varied from eyebrow, penis, nose, sometimes all at the same time. And sometimes they weren't there. And I had people, yeah, some people worried that they, the tingles had disappeared and they felt back to normal. They wondered if that was a bad thing. But yeah, it's definitely a favourite topic, isn't it? And I, I think I had really intense tingles in my hands and fingers. It was really like distracting something. <laughs> yeah, there. it's pretty full on, isn't it? And I think mm. that that day um, is the first. You're at very high altitude, and it's a big, big climb, isn't it? And I think that f I think I kind of echo your experiences. I think personally, we had a really challenging lunchtime. Um, I think. It was a, I remember being really, really busy and just about managing some food. So everybody had a bit of appetite suppression, but um, bowed on. They were great and a bit of shortness of breath on exertion. Um, but I do remember somebody over lunch vomiting, somebody else having a panic attack uh, and obviously not managing much food myself. So it was all a bit traumatic. And then can you remember you climb up really, really high and then morale kind of drops because after that absolute beasting the whole group gets, you then have to descend basically the same amount and they're all, they all get so sad <laughs> yeah yeah and they build it as like an acclimatization day don't they but i think like yeah. i say it's like the first taste of altitude and you get up to um lava tower and yeah lots of i remember lots of my group not really wanting to eat lots of them had headaches um mm. 
some people really struggling with like severe headache. Uh, well, I say severe, it makes it sound like they were sort of going down with haste, but just, mm. you know, the, the AMS head. headache of the mm. trip. Yeah. So people getting a first proper taste of altitude, but then most people, by the time we got back down to Barranco were fine. Mm. Um, I think I actually found it challenging because yeah, so I didn't feel great at Lava Tower. Um, mm. And then when we were going down, I had to sort of um, coach one of the girls down. She was very just quite slow, struggling mm. a little bit. Um, but I it was quite it a long sort of. You slow. needed quite yeah, and you needed good uh, good balance and to be someone. If you weren't someone that did a lot of walking, I remember it was a long descent over quite bouldery fields, mm. wasn't it? I think um, on the knees and, and on the legs, it's harder to go slower on the downhill for me personally. I think it, I find it yeah. almost more tiring and you're out for longer. You're sort of in the sun for longer and yeah, the weather on Killy. It, so I think we were probably very lucky, but we had beautiful weather every single day. Um, clear we skies, did. sunny, probably 20 to 25 mm. degrees maybe yeah. um, in the daytime. So we're all sun creamed up wearing hats and sunglasses, but then obviously very cold at night just loses the heat really, really quickly. Mm. Um, so yeah, I was sort of out for quite a long time that day. So I think that's probably why I was a bit knackered. Your nod towards the pizza. I know we can't talk on the WEM podcast too much about food, but pizza halfway up Kilimanjaro. And it was really good as well. It was really good. That is exactly what I needed. I needed to be told that at Lava Tower that there was pizza at the bottom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Of course. And I, uh, I think it was either here or the night before where we all discovered Milo in a big way. So Milo's that powdered hot chocolate stuff. And uh, it's my like group a found it. rip off, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And it was like my group discovered it in a big way. I mean, by the end, we were, everyone was demanding Milo more than anything else. I think probably if there was sort of a randomized controlled trial, I think they'd find Milo to be more addictive than crack. Probably they were all hooked, but, um, yeah, like yours, I think lots of people were getting uh, headaches, a bit of diarrhea, nausea. They were also um, getting a bit of the cough. Um, I did encourage buff wearing, but, it, you know, they're not pleasant to wear, are they? So a few yeah. people were starting to get a cough. You don't mean like a hape cough, do you? You mean like a dust no, cough? No, sorry, dusty cough, yeah. Mm. Yeah, feeling otherwise well, but um, just a cough from the dust. Um, and then people did start wearing their buffs a bit more religiously, but I'm I've become a bit more strict on my um, on the buff wearing now because uh, I I see what you know, quite how damaging um, the dust and the early days can be. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then we've mentioned again like sleep. Uh, so people start sleeping poorly at altitude, and then that kind of has a knock on effect of morale, energy, mm. fatigue, which um, we I think we were advised to use the Lake Louise score bar, our, our organisation, but mm. you ask everybody if they're fatigued, they're like, yes. <laughs> yeah. It's like, have you got sleep disturbance? Yes. Do you feel breathless? Yes. Do you have a headache? Yes. It's like, oh, well, this is yeah. not a very useful score then, is it? <laughs> yeah, let's send everyone down. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, no, I completely agree. I think, yeah, it's much more a sort of clinical judgment, isn't it? Um, but I... I did think for my group, it was at this stage as well that I'm sure you had the same. They started to, uh, there was a lot of questions about the summit night and people were getting very focused by now because it's, it suddenly looms, doesn't it? It feels like it's quite a long way away. And then suddenly, oh, it's tomorrow night, essentially. It's mad. Oh yeah, it is, isn't it? They've only got one more day and then it's the following yeah. night. Yeah, yeah. Um, that used to cause because of the, you know, obviously technically it's a different day, but actually they're only going to bed for three hours or two hours. Or, yeah. yeah, I think I say that, don't they? That this is the last good chance for mm. a good night's sleep within this reflection. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so then we had the next day, which actually I think was a bit of a highlight for us, wasn't it? It was um, yeah. quite fun. We loved it. Going up the Barranco Wall. Um, oh. If you've got a bit of an outdoorsy, a bit of an outdoorsy bone in your body, then definitely the Barranco Wall, I think, is a highlight. A bit of, a bit more technical and fun, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Okay. Let's hear about it. Let's see what I've got to say. Uh, Barranco to Barafu Camp. So we start in the morning, nice and early, as always. Five thirty, wake up, and we climb Barranco Wall. Just a really cool little scrambly bit. Um, 
lots of hands involved, lots of cool footwork, kind of polished rock in places, quite steep, quite vertical. And it was quite a challenge for people who had a problem with heights. Um, but they managed to do it, so really proud of everyone. And we had a really nice view at the top. We had to move super slow because it was so vertical. Um, and we were all struggling to catch our breath. We then had a little bit of up and down, kind of undulating ascent and descent across sort of alpine desert um, before we got to Karanga Camp, uh, which is where we had lunch. And normally in the seven-day Machama route, you would stop at the Karanga Camp and you would stay a night and acclimatise. We didn't do this. We carried on to Barafu Base Camp, uh, which is where we were going to start our summit night from. And I think in retrospect, that would have been quite nice to have a seven-day route and to have a little bit more time to acclimatise. Um, the climb up to Karanga was quite steep. Um, it's quite a sort of 20-minute incline before we get up to Karanga, which is about 4,600, I think, in total. And that is where we're going to have to leave it for part one of Kilimanjaro Diaries, leaving it on a cliffhanger like all good podcast hosts to make sure that you tune into the next episode to hear what happened next on the mountain. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please feel free to rate, review and subscribe on whichever platform you're listening to. Please also head over to the World Extreme Medicine website where you can find more engaging content on extreme medicine webinars and indeed the collection of courses from our global network, including humanitarian, disaster relief, expedition, space, military, tactical and performance medicine. Thanks again.